just give a bit of background in terms of who on earth we are and who on earth indeed um, CVIA or the CV and interview advice is concerned. You've been invited via the Talent Spa website um, as a member or candidate registered with Talent Spa. Um, I'm not part of Talent Spa. I work for the CV and interview advisors and we're a partner with Talent Spa and provide advice and guidance on a range of uh, CV writing and career enhancements products. So we'd like to think we're one of the the best providers in the marketplace. Um, importantly, if there's one lesson you should learn, and there's probably a handful of really key things to take away from this evening, but probably one, if not the most important thing, is that um, although we do talk about CVs and we refer to the documents as CVs, um, in effect what we're writing when we write our client CVs and what we'd recommend you do if you're doing something yourself is try and imagine it as a business case as opposed to CV per se. Um, we'll talk a little bit later about some of the mistakes people make on their CVs and why perhaps viewing it as a business case, particularly if you're a contractor or interim manager, as to why you should switch emphasis and start thinking of it in a different way, because that will automatically protect you from making some of the errors that most people make on their documents currently. So when we're going about the business, it is essential that we view it and we encourage everybody else to view it as being a business case in effect as to why somebody should be bothered to hire you, um, which is slightly different from how most people approach their CV. The people that work within our business are a mixture of folk. Um, most have been either senior execs, recruitment experts, and in, indeed we even have some published authors, and that's quite important at that point for reasons that will become clear later. Um, essentially, in the market as it currently stands and for the foreseeable future, it's quite important to know what uh, employers are looking for and indeed some recruiters are looking for in terms of hot skills. A um, bit of a cliche, but I'm afraid it's the best way of describing a set of skills that do change and evolve over time. So what was popular five, six years ago isn't necessarily popular now. If your CV reflects skills that are dormant, aged, or irrelevant, then automatically you start off on the back foot. Um, so it's important to know what's currently hot um, and then provide the evidence to back up your abilities in those areas. A lot of people don't understand their own marketplace, um, which means their document isn't a business case as to why somebody should hire them. It's just merely a, a list of things that they've done in their life, which is, is not really where the market is at the moment. And a bit like the fact we act for Talent Spa and represent their interests as far as CV advice is concerned, we are um, resident experts within a number of high-profile organizations, including the PCG for those people that have uh, a membership of the professional contractors group. Then we're, we're, we're associated with them as well and provide their CV and uh, career enhancement guidance. So um, I guess bottom line is, as far as my involvement with this evening is concerned, is that as a person from a corporate background, a recruiting background, a CV reviewing background, and a writing background, hopefully, um, whilst it is a very subjective area and uh, encourages all sorts of comments and views and myths and comments about uh, what's good and what's not, um, we'd like to think we've got a reasonable platform of knowledge to be able to help people um, and to accurately help and guide them in terms of writing a CV. Uh, proof will be in the pudding, I guess, and, and based on what you think of this evening's session. So that's a bit about who on earth we are. Um, let's talk a little bit about some of the things that you people face um, as contractors or interim managers in the marketplace, and some of the challenges that they typically throw in our general direction when we're talking with them. Um, these will be the familiar or less so with yourselves. You might have other challenges that you face, but typically these are the the top three or four things that people talk to us about. Um, one of them is that by listing every job they've done, every contract that they've had, um, they'll end up with a document that's very long. Uh, there is a bit of an urban myth in terms of how long a CV should be. Um, some people wake up in the morning thinking it's got to be two pages. Some people think it should be one page. Um, very few people think it should be more than four pages. Um, the truth, the reality is that most people making an important decision, unless they've specifically stated otherwise, they're not really bothered within reason how long the CV is. is. Um, what they're really bothered by is the content within the CV. The harsh reality is that most recruiters and virtually all employers will not express an opinion that's valid, truthful, or relevant, or all of those three things, to you directly. 
be that via email, face to face or over the telephone. What you will get is a whole heap of feedback which sounds plausible, sometimes may not sound plausible, but you probably would assume is plausible, but actually is not the real issue where maybe your CV got rejected or indeed whether people thought it was good, bad or indifferent. The very question, what makes a good CV, conjures up all sorts of answers and actually means different things to different people. So a recruiter will often look at a CV and because of the people you've worked for, would judge that to be a good CV technically because of the, the people that you've worked for and therefore the assumption will be if you've worked for those kind of people, you must be all right and thereby by inference they view your CV as being a good CV because of its its um, story, the story that it's telling. Structurally, the document might be, might be an absolute nightmare, but they've picked something out that's relevant. So even that very simple question, have I got a good CV, will often, often elicit a response that actually won't help you develop it going forwards. Um, as I say, employers probably won't give you an honest view because they'll fear litigation, discrimination, all sorts of other weird things. Um, and so will be reticent to give you any meaningful um, impression as to what your CV actually means to them. They'll tell their recruiter, if their recruiter relationship is reasonably strong, I guarantee you they'll be saying to their recruiter contacts or HR contacts, you know, Joe Bloggs had a useless CV, I'm not going to see them. And they'll say things as blunt as that, we've seen it happen, we know it goes on, but that will never get fed back to you as an individual. So this, the length of the CV is a bit of an urban myth, unless you specifically ask for a two-page document, wouldn't worry about it. What's in really important is the content on it, more of which later. Another challenge that contractors face is that recruiters might often say to them, sometimes employers, that they get judged because of their last project. Um, so for example, if you're a project, sorry, if you're a program manager and you're used to managing lots and lots of projects, but for some reason, maybe during the recession, um, you took a more junior role, pro project manager for one aspect of life somewhere, um, and people then start judging you as being a project manager rather than the program manager you are rightly um, able to pull off as a role. You might be harshly judged and find it hard to gain traction for those more senior opportunities. Um, so people are judged because of what they've done most recently. Um, so that's something that we have to deal with and we've got some answers for later. Um, linked to that, um, to some degree, is the fact that quite often contractors have done lots of different types of jobs, sometimes quite meaningful and senior, sometimes relatively junior and, and menial, um, still performed a role but just perceived to be lesser than other roles they've performed. Um, and so they find themselves being harshly judged because what they were doing at a period of time doesn't quite fit the recruiter or employer's expectations and because they typically are stuck in a chronological order of things on their CV, they find it difficult to explain what they'd really like to get across which is their capability in another area that's maybe more relevant to the recruiter or employer or offers the prospect of being a more senior individual. So we've got ways of dealing with that as well. Um, by the very nature of your roles, often people are working in different environments, different sectors, um, maybe different levels. So trying to make a CV um, appeal to all those different opportunities. So some project managers could be business analysts, for example. Some business analysts could be project managers. And lots of other multiple hats that people can wear. How do you construct a document that appeals to those different types of audiences? Again, we'll touch on solutions to those kind of problems. And there are probably a whole host of other issues floating around. And if you've got any particular issues yourselves and you want to ask a question, as I say, just plonk it in the question box and I'll deal with it at the end and try and give some kind of sane answer. So having said, there are obviously challenges that most contractors face at some point in their lives and, and there's probably a whole host of other ones besides. Um, one of the important things that you have to make a decision on, you may have already come to this conclusion, hence attending this evening's webinar, um, but one of the key things that you have to be able to do is assess the performance of the CV. If you're not going to get great feedback from recruiters and employers, if any at all, how do you know whether your CV is actually up to the job um, and doing what it's supposed to do? Well, the ACID test, and this is irrespective of what anybody tells you, including myself, I have to say, at the absolute ACID test is the interview to applications ratio whatever those applications may be. So you see an opportunity, 
it's something that you hand on, and this does assume, of course, that you're applying for things that are relevant to your competency, framework, experience, knowledge, skills, whatever. So if you're a IT project manager and you're trying to become a nuclear submarine captain, then this stack goes out the window because guess what? It's not, not, it's not going to happen unless there's somebody very desperate out there to pilot their submarines. So let's assume for the moment that whatever you're gunning for is, uh, to the best of your knowledge, something that you know you could perform or would have a reasonable chance of performing, even if it's a bit of a stretch. Um, assuming that, and you send your document, your CV, your business case out to 10 applications, let's say, if you're getting interviews um, or some other engagement with the decision maker to 7, 8, 9 or all 10 of those applications, your CV or whatever you're sending out in the marketplace is doing a pretty good job. And truth be told, there's not a lot anybody's going to be able to do to make it substantially better. If you're not getting any interest at all, um, or one or two or three hits to those 10 applications, there's a problem somewhere. Again, assuming that you're applying for things you know you could do. And, and if you get that horrible sinking feeling where you're thinking, why didn't that happen? Why didn't I get some interest? What is it? What's wrong with these people? I could do that job. Yeah, I'm not getting an interview. Why is that? Um, don't don't take what you're told. If they are, if anybody does give you a reason for not being invited to interview at face value, um, what, you're, what you're being told may be plausible, and in some cases, I would say it might actually be true. But the harsh reality is, if you're not getting the interviews for something you know you could perform, and you've got the abilities to demonstrate that you could perform those roles, then somewhere along the line, and it's nearly always the CV, nearly always. Um, that's the problem. It's the interpretation of what you're sending somebody. It could be something simple. Spelling mistakes, for example, will for some people be an, an instant rejection, irrespective of your talents otherwise. Um, strange structure format, um, something that's not, hard, uh, not easy to understand or comprehend will be a good reason. Um, if you fill the first page of your CV with a whole load of rubbish that's not relevant to your target audience, again, more of which later, it'll get rejected straight away. <laughs> the trouble is, you'll very rarely get anybody tell you that face to face, as I said earlier. What people will say is there were people more suited to the role. Um, there were a lot of applicants and um, they found two or three people that were really well experienced. You'll have a whole load of explanation that doesn't actually say the problem was your message wasn't compelling enough. And the harsh reality is if you're not getting the interviews, your message isn't compelling enough, otherwise people will be interviewing you. Now, obviously, if there are no applications to make and there's nothing out there in the marketplace, you can't do anything about that. But even in the tough times that we've had, there have been opportunities. And if you're making even one application and you know you can perform the role, if you're not winning the interest, it's the CV that's almost certainly the problem, whatever anybody will tell you. So do the stats. Don't spend too long doing the stats because bottom line is if you've got a problem, you can and must do something about it and you've got two main options with which you consider. You either fix it yourself and this evening will help you do that and take the steps in that direction or you get somebody to help you and we're one of the people that could help you. Um, but it's just not worth hanging around waiting to compile the stats if you've already got a body of opinion that suggests that you're just not getting the interest you'd expect to get. And if that's the case, as I say, get something done about it. Now in the invite and sort of registration form that you will have seen um, if, you, if you read any of the detail when you registered for this webinar, you sort of hinted that one of the things you'll learn about tonight is um, the two most successful formats for contractor CVs. And there is a difference, or there can be a difference, on how contractors treat their CV from a traditional permanent kind of employee. Um, I'll go through both formats. Um, I'm going to focus this evening pretty much on what we call the alternative a format for contractors um, and I'll touch on the other format which is a more traditional chronological style. I'll talk a bit about that but this is one of the areas that needs a little bit more analysis with people and discussion. So if at the end of this session you decide you do need help um, and you engage our services in some form or other then one of the things we'd be wanting to do with you is to have a discussion about which format of CV would seem to offer the best solution for your particular needs. But as I say, we are going to focus um, on one particular aspect. 
So the more traditional style, um, most people would refer to as a chronological style of CV. We offer that. It can work for contractors, as I'll come on to later, um, as long as you build in a certain tweak, which I'll also come on to. And then the, the, the format that I'm going to focus on this evening mo most of, in terms of time and detail, is what we'd call a case study or portfolio format. Um, and it's particularly useful in getting across uh, the message that you are a contractor, that you've got lots of different experiences across maybe lots of different employers, possibly in lots of different sectors, um, and even within that, lots of different projects, even if they were within the same employer at a similar time period. Um, how do you get all of that jumbled message across more effectively? That's a brilliant way of doing that, and we'll go into that in some detail shortly. Just to briefly talk about the chronological style, though, with this um, infamous tweak. Um, the kind of people it would suit really well are those people who are relatively new to the contract market. So, for example, um, you've either just started out in life and you've decided to become a contractor, or you've had a largely permanent career to date and have either recent or had just about to embark on the contract market. A more traditional style of CV would suit you better, generally speaking. It also would suit pretty much any contractor who is invariably dealing with recruiters who don't really understand, they don't get the contract market. They might even refer to it still as being or looked after by people that run their temp desks. If you've encountered any of those kind of recruiters um, and deal predominantly with them, um, the more traditional chronological style of CV would probably suit you more as well, almost irrespective of how much contract experience you've got. It's more about your target audience, and if your target audience is recruiters that actually just don't get the market, then this, this safer policy is probably a better policy. If you're involved in uh, applying for opportunities which are largely within what we'd call a high transactional recruitment process, so that's where you're up against lots of people, um, then big employers, they get lots of applications from lots of candidates for all sorts of jobs, including contractors, and you're being part, put, put through a, a very high volume um, process where there may be automated sifting to start with, and you're treated really just as a person with a set of skills, and there's no real interest in, the, in anything deeper than that, at least to start with, then again, this style of CV may suit you better. Um, but where you can actually apply directly to employers, maybe a you know, medium-sized and smaller employers, then again, I think our, our slightly alternative approach would be better for you. The tweak that I refer to is, um, and we'll go into a little bit more detail about this later, but it's all about the structure of the document. Um, so very briefly, most people and most CVs, and you'll know whether this is true of yourselves, um, if you've got a CV that follows a chronological style, people tend to open up with possibly some kind of opening statement about themselves, which tends to be rather unfocused and often describes behavioral skills that they have, which are totally irrelevant. So if you've got a CV that opens up with anything like, um, you know, I am a such and such and I, um, I'm you know, really enthusiastic, passionate, dedicated, um, great interpersonal skills, can work well as uh, an individual or as part of a team. If you've got any of that on your CV, doesn't matter what style you choose, that's not a great approach. It's not differentiating. It's not building a business case as to why somebody should hire you. So you need to shift the focus dramatically, and we'll show you how later. Um, but if you start off with that, and then you drop into, and my most recent project or assignment was here doing this for such and such an employer, um, there are a number of dangers with that. Um, or if you open up with your education, or you move into that before explaining to people what you're actually capable of. Um, all of those things are bad because you're hitting people between the eyes with information that actually may be harmful to you rather than productive. So our argument about building a business case starts right at the beginning of the CV, on page one, top of page one, and we'll come on to the structure in a bit more detail, as I say, later. But the, the tweak that we put on all of our CVs um, is that we highlight, by way of case study examples, projects that you've worked on or been involved with that materially demonstrate competencies that you have in some detail so that before people find out where you've worked, what you've been doing, what roles you've had, you're giving them the evidence to suggest that you could actually solve the problems that they've got. 
So a well-crafted CV to build this strong business case will get the message about your competence in the areas that are relevant to your target audience before saying virtually anything else. And most people get that hideously wrong. Most people go all guns blazing, talk about things that A, are irrelevant to the target audience, then go straight into where they're currently working or have most recently worked. Um, and that's just opening the door to a whole host of problems because the reader may not have a good view about who you're currently working for and they may have had a bad experience with them or somebody working with them. It's a whole host of things you can't control um, in the mind of the recruiter or HR person. So our view is build your business case and part of building that business case before you tell them where you've worked is demonstrating by way of example things that you've done that they will find compelling. It won't stop all of the problems and it, we can't get around all of the problems that we, we talked about earlier, those challenges that some contractors face, but it will help build a, a business case as to why somebody should hire you. Um, so that's the tweak and again we'll touch on that a little bit later for this more traditional style of CV. As I sort of made reference to, the, the first page of your CV is the most critical one. Um, a lot of people don't realise this, but however strong your CV is or not, for most opportunities that most people apply for, you will be one of possibly tens if not hundreds of applicants. Now, it matters not whether half of those applicants are relevant or not for the job to some degree because they're creating noise in the system. Somebody's got to do something with them to make a judgment on whether they should be progressed or not. And if you've ever watched a recruiter or an HR person do the filtering on a whole bunch of applicants for a role, it's fairly brutal. You don't get the luxury of somebody sitting down with a cup of coffee, considering your document um, over that cup of coffee um, and, and, and going through the whole thing in any detail. That just doesn't happen unless there's maybe only been a handful of applicants. What's likely to happen is that there'll have been a lot of applicants because they've advertised it far and wide. Um, they've aggregated all the applications into a special piece of software, even if they're a fairly um, small employer, that, that software is quite cheap and available and sometimes provided by job boards themselves. Um, and they'll literally whiz through applicants and there will often be a, an amber, a red and a green button and they'll just click as they scan across the CV to think, is this somebody I think I would like to look at again in more detail later or not. So you may get 5 to 20 seconds of somebody's time, and if you try reading 5 to 20 seconds worth of your CV, you'll get somewhere down page 1, and you won't get very far. Um, and so if the first 20 seconds worth of real estate that you're offering the world on your CV doesn't create this business case and a strong message about how you could solve this particular employer's problems, you'll be in the no pile or have had the red light attached to your document details pretty quickly um, and that will be the last you hear of it. So it is fairly brutal so you need to make sure that first page is really compelling and strong and in effect if the employer or recruiter is looking for a square peg your CV needs to be saying pretty much I am that square peg, um, not hexagonal, not ovoid, not square and uh, not uh, circular, um, not any other shape than square. And that's how, that's how brutal it needs to be. So that's a bit about the chronological style. Um, again, if you've got more questions about that, we'll come back to it later. But the detail I wanted to go into this evening is more about this slightly alternative style that really suits out-and-out -out contractors well, um, or people who are dealing in the marketplace, which is well understood, where recruiters understand um, uh, the kind of work that you're doing, the nature of your work, and that um, the fact that you've done lots of different things in lots of different places and maybe had gaps in the time that you've done them, which is quite traditional for most contractors and interim workers. They don't have a seamless career chronology. Um, if, you, if you have, that's quite lucky and unusual. For most people, there are gaps, there are short assignments, long assignments, and everything in between. So this is a really good way of getting around some of the challenges we talked about earlier. One of the advantages of following what we call this case study of portfolio style, and I will show you later an example for real, as it were, once I've talked you through the, the sections and some of the background, is that it allows you to escape the chronological order of things. A lot of contractors feel hemmed in by having to stick to some kind of chronological order, which is uh, very frustrating sometimes because, as I've mentioned, you get judged on your last contract, 
which may have not been the best one to be judged by from your point of view. Um, you may have done lots of different things, and things that are really relevant for this particular opportunity are buried into your CV two, three, four years ago. Um, so how do you bring them forward if you've got to stick to your chronological order? It's very frustrating. So this methodology allows you to escape that and present to your target audience the contract in the order you'd like to present them, not in the order that you feel compelled to, have to present them because of time and, and the chronological order. Each of the bits of evidence that you present to your target audience are written in a consistent format, so it's very easy for people to read. It's not a rambling uh, walk through your life, which is not productive. It doesn't mean that the CV is going to be particularly long. Um, it just means that you give consideration to the important bits of evidence that you've got from your sort of toolkit of experiences, and you present that in a well, a well constructed way to your to your target audience. Um, if it's done properly, you'll land up with some powerful. And the key thing here is evidence-based case studies. If you like these real-life stories, explanations of stuff that you've been involved with, which will be compelling and will be well understood by your target audience. And you know, notice I keep talking about your target audience and building the business case. You have to view yourself, as, a, as many of you might already do, as, as a mini-business. Um, you're a product, you're a service to the wider world. You've got something to offer. Um, if you consider anything you've bought yourselves recently, a car, a house, a washing machine, a TV, um, you'll have encountered a variety of marketing messages sales messages to help guide and educate you about which was the most appropriate product to buy and you'll either disagreed or agreed with various statements made in those bits of marketing and sales based collateral. Um, you have to view yourselves in the same way whether you like that or not. That the market demands that kind of approach and will respect it if it's well presented and it helps people make a better decision about hiring you. And so um, like most things, if you've got real case studies that you can reflect to your target audience um, and, and it hits a chord with them, they'll be thinking far more positively about you than a sort of rambling list of duties and responsibilities that you've had in your life, which could have been, could in fact been shared with lots of people. Things that you've actually done differentiate you from the masses and that's what you need to get across on your CV. And again, we'll come on to the structure of those case studies very shortly, but that, that's the important message. Um, so, so far we've said, okay, if you're a contractor, there's a couple of ways you can structure your CV. You can stick to a more traditional chronological format, but before you dive into that, make sure you're presenting evidence to your target audience about what you can do, and, and relevant evidence, of course, not just things you feel that you are good at and that you enjoyed, things that actually your target audience will find compelling because of what you've done and how you've achieved it. Um, and then we've suggested that there's another way to structure your CV which is far more evidence-based where you're not constrained by the chronological order of things if you feel that um, hampers your ability to communicate what you're capable of. And so if you've got big gaps in your career, if you've done lots of different things and you want to bring out things that happened a fair time ago, this slightly alternative way of building your CV is a really effective way of getting those messages across. You can't change the world, you know, you, you've got to tell it as it is, but it enables you to reposition your strengths to whoever you're sending the document to. Um, so at least you've got your best foot forward rather than actually starting with a, um, a, a bit of a sort of lead weight around you um, and, and hindering you because you're not able to communicate your true capabilities to your target audience. Now, in terms of the structure of the CV itself, and again, I'm going to be focusing mainly on this more, um, this alternative version, sort of case study based CV. I hinted at earlier that we need to start off with um, some kind of opening statement to your CV. So we'll go through each section of the CV now briefly and explain what you need to get right and how do you build this business case um, uh, in, in each of the compartments that we would be doing it if, if, we, if we wrote a CV for you and how we approach uh, writing CV for our clients. So the very first thing is that we open up with this is um, what we call it a professional summary or an executive summary. Some people tend to call it personal profile or profile. Um, it doesn't really matter what you call it. The content is absolutely vital though. And 
there are some things that you need to make sure uh, that you're conveying in that opening statement. So you can, uh, you'll, you can do this analysis against your current CV. The very first thing you need to do, which may seem a bit obvious, but you'd be surprised how many people don't do it, is actually state what you are. Um, so if you're a, um, uh, an interim manager in, a, in finance, you state that. If you're a project manager in IT, you state it. If you're a business analyst, you state that. You reflect, in effect, what um, the target audience is expecting to see for the role you're applying for, if you can justify that and, and, and label yourself as that, in combination with your main skill set. So actually mention what on earth you are. Don't leave people to guess that or assume it because of what you've put later on in your CV. It's essential that you convey some aspect about what value you have to offer the world. So whatever your day rate is, or your hourly rate, or your monthly rate, or however you decide to get remunerated, it's going to involve thousands of pounds somewhere along the line for the employer, probably. Um, and therefore, they're going to want to expect to get some return on that. They may not mention that overtly, but almost certainly that's part of the calculation going on in their mind particularly for contractors. They're thinking, you know, we've got a budget, or if we haven't got a budget, we know roughly what we want to pay. Um, they want a return on that investment. You've got to be able to convince somebody pretty quickly that you would appear to be able to offer a return on that investment. So what is the core thing that you're able to do for a business? We'll look at an example in a minute for a particular kind of individual. Um, but what is that value proposition? It's a horrible cliche, but I'm afraid it's the best way of explaining it. What have you got to offer? What is the return on the investment you can provide? And then you need to follow that with maybe a handful of things that you're very good at that are and you know are relevant to what the audience is expecting to see uh, and what the marketplace demands. So there's no point in going on about skills that you have which are now irrelevant or old or ineffective or under, uh, um, under the radar as far as the target audience is concerned. You've got to reflect what they're actually looking for and then be able to justify that later on in the CV. And as I hinted at earlier, you need to avoid mentioning anything that's not provable on the CV. So there's no point in talking about being able to work um, as an individual or as part of a team, because how on earth are they going to assess that until much later on in the process? That will not get you an interview. There's no point in talking about interpersonal skills, because that will not get you an interview. You'll be judged on them, and they're important skills to have, but that judgment will be later on in the process. So focus on the functional, demonstrable skills and competences that you possess. Do not get hoovered into the, the typical kind of approach just because you've seen it on other people's CVs or just because somewhere in the job spec somebody's saying you must have communication skills. Um, putting communication skills on your CV um, is not going to match up with that and get you an interview because most recruiters and employers just glaze over when they see that. They know it's important but they're judging that later on in the process when they actually physically meet you. Um, and even then, it'll be quite hard to judge them for sure. So avoid all that stuff and focus on the stuff you can actually talk about and prove. Good way of thinking about it, as I hinted at earlier, if you've bought a washing machine, a car, or a fridge, or whatever, um, any kind of um, product or service, you'll have probably been encouraged to because you linked a feature that the product or service had with the benefit that you'd accrue. And as I said earlier, you've got to provide your target audience with a reason for why they should hire you, justification of the investment they're going to make in you. So just try and think of it, if, if you've um, uh, ever been in sales or anything like this, it would be easier for you than for others. But for every feature, there has to be a benefit. So when people try and flog you a car, you know, a good salesperson will say, yeah, it's got anti-lock brakes, um, that's the feature. The benefit is it'll st stop you or help prevent you sliding, having an accident, stuffing somebody up um, in front of you when they hit the brakes, driving safer on the ice in the wet, whatever, whatever you want to look at, whatever benefit, and there are lots of benefits of anti-lock brakes, but it's that way of thinking. So it's all right to talk about features in some regard and say, well, I'm good at this, but then, then the question would be, well, so big deal, so what? What, what does that mean to me, the employer? What am I going to get in return? So try and think of it that way. Um, if you've got a skill, you've got to be able to add some value somewhere, and you've got to make that clearer than most people tend to on their CV. Um, 
the comment at the bottom is actually quite important in red because a lot of people don't understand, as I mentioned earlier, they don't understand what the hot skills in their marketplace are. So they find it hard to reflect them on the CV because they don't know what they are in the first place. And so um, if uh, you have reached a point where you're thinking, hmm, I do need help with my CV, um, as I said earlier, you've got the choice. You can either fix it yourself or you seek professional help. Um, if you fix it yourself, just make sure you find out what those hot skills are. But it's one of the things that a lot of people use us for is to actually unlock that information in the first place and then link it with the experience that you've had to make sure that we then write some compelling content on your CV to make sure that it gets the message across. So there is a fine line between uh, creating a document that is obviously going to be quite salesy and um, compelling, but it's not there to make you uh, look um, over ambitious, it's not to take you on an egotistical road trip, it's to make you look relevant for the target audience's expectations. Um, so as I said earlier, if they're recruiting in effect um, a problem to their solution, sorry, a solution to their problem is going to be this infamous square peg, then your CV's got to be a document which, which in effect paints a picture of you being that square peg pretty clearly. Um, and then there's a match. Um, and you'll be surprised what what a big difference that makes. If you're just sending people a list of things that you've done and you're expecting them to join all the dots and come up to a conclusion that is positive, well, the stats will tell you everything. If you're getting interviews with your current document to a satisfactory level that gets you jobs and opportunities, happy days, then you're okay. But if that's not working for you, it's almost certainly because whatever you're sending into the marketplace is not getting interest and traction to a satisfactory level. The difficulty is you'll not really know what the problem is until somebody tells you, and I don't think many people get told honestly what the problem is. So it then tends up to be tends to be people like us who have to say, I'm sorry, but the reason why things aren't happening is likely to be because, and then we'll list a whole load of things where we think it's going wrong, and they can be fixed nearly always, 99 times out of 100, those problems can be fixed, and this can, can certainly be improved. That's for sure. Um, but it is important that you understand what's going on in the marketplace and build a document, a business case that reflects that expectation. So therefore, you've got a, you've got a structure for the opening section of your CV, which, it, which needs to contain those particular bullet points. Let's take a look at an example. Um, so on the screen shortly will appear, um, it looks a bit deeper and heavier than it would actually look on a CV. Um, so it, again, it's the content that's important. Don't worry about the actual size of the text. It's, it's really so you can read the thing. Um, but here's a, a paragraph, which I'll just let you read for yourselves. I won't go through it at length. Um, but it answers all of the questions we just stated. So this would appear at the top of somebody's CV. Happens to be for a finance director. But anybody can write one of these. Doesn't matter what level you are, what job you have, whether you have a job at all, whether you've got any experience at all, it doesn't matter. You can mention and build a statement like this um, for literally anybody. Um, and the questions that it addresses are, that, well, what is this person? What are they? They're an experienced finance director. Dead easy. Um, what's their value proposition? They can protect cash flow and profitability. Um, what are the handful of things they're good at where you can see them for yourself? Um, and, and so on and so on. So it's a very clear statement. Um, you'll notice it doesn't make reference to anything about enthusiasm, interpersonal skills, communication skills, dedication, um, or any of those other behavioral traits that I sort of red flagged earlier. So anybody can write one of those. Um, it's not as easy as it may seem. Um, plenty of people have a go, then send us their efforts, and, and they don't quite hit the mark. But just a little bit of thought, a little bit of knowledge, and you can pull something together like that, which makes a big difference. After that, um, so we've got an opening professional summary statement. Um, it's quite good for a number of reasons to highlight some key skills that you possess, um, be they technical, functional, commercial, whatever they may be. But the, the reason why I mention a couple of reasons why they're good is that visually they break up the CV. Most uh, employers and recruiters set out in a document the kind of things that they're really looking for in an individual. And this is a great area to A, customize the CV, 
and reflect those desirable or essential characteristics that the recruiters are looking for on the document itself on page one and towards the top of page one. So if somebody's scanning the document, they're getting a reaffirmation visually of the things that they know that they're looking for. It doesn't matter whether they're true or not. Well, actually, it doesn't matter. It costs matters that they're true. But my point is, you're not going into depth at this stage. You're not trying to make um, a big statement about certain things, like whether you're Prince 2 qualified or not. If you just mention the fact you've got Prince 2 project management skills, that is a typical example of what you put in a box here um, and describe. If you've got team leadership skills, you could mention that. It's not looking for proof at this stage. It's just you're reaffirming that the fact that you've got certain skills to offer the marketplace that, that you or we know the recruiter is looking for. So what we tend to do, and there's just a few coming up on the screen right now, we put two, three, maybe four words at stretch bullet points on the CV. Um, not this many, typically. We're probably be looking somewhere between 10 and 14, so between five and seven on each side of the page structurally a bit like you see on the screen right now but again where most people go wrong where they give this a try themselves they just list a whole load of things they think are important completely failing to understand what the target audience would judge to be important so you know, obviously most people could list quite easily a handful of skills that they've got but they have to be relevant to the marketplace relevant to the role um, and you need to be able to change them for different roles. So having a core CV and then keeping it exactly the same for all applications, unless they're exactly the same kind of job, is wholly pointless. You need to be able to reflect what the recruiter or employer is looking for in this area, and that changes almost by job. But it's a great area that's easy to update and change so that you've got that flexibility. So these may not be relevant skills for you per se, but they're examples of how you'd phrase certain key skills um, and again later on in the CV you, there would be places where you could prove this and demonstrate by way of example your competence in these areas but as I say it's really good for people to look quickly and, and they'll feel comfortable if they see the things they're actually recruiting for you be amazed how much a difference that makes to people's reactions because they'll be thinking positive thoughts about you rather than negative thoughts if you get this area right. The other advantage, of course, is electronic in that if you get the phrase and the wording right, as soon as your CV enters electronic databases, job boards, websites, LinkedIn, whatever, um, all the indexing that goes on will help get your CV noticed and picked up because of the right keywords that you're using, the phrases that you're using. So again, it really puts a lot of focus on getting this area right because it will help you get noticed automatically. Um, by the various searches that go on um, once your CV enters the system. It's a really important area, but actually quite easy to construct if done properly. So that's the second area. So we start the CV with a professional summary. We've then got an area for key skills. Now, as far as the contract star CV that I've talked about, so this is a case study portfolio format. The next thing that we'd want to be talking about is just a brief statement about what your current role is. Now, in most people cases, this is not detail about your current project, so don't confuse it with that. It's about your status as a contractor or an interim manager, and so would basically include a, just a brief description, I'll show you again an example in a minute, um, of when did you start being a contractor. Um, if you have a particular job title, um, so if you're a project manager, for example, or a business analyst, um, or um, non-exec director, or an interim manager generally, or an HR generalist, you might put that kind of general job title that you, you tend to hold. You don't have to put a job title if it varies enormously, um, but you might want to put it if, if all you ever want to target is a particular type of role. And the company that you work under if you're operating a limited business, um, or reference to whatever kind of trading entity you have, umbrella company, whatever. Now, the reason why this is important is that because, remember, this CV tends to work well with recruiters who understand the marketplace and the contract marketplace. It's just reaffirming that you are a contractor, a professional contractor or freelancer or interim manager, and that you have been operating that way for a period of time, 
um, and that you are operating in a, in a legal space or with a legal entity that would mean something to that recruiter or employer because they would expect to see that and conveyed with that goes all of the uh, the legal side of things, the um, insurance side of things and the protection side of things that, that people would expect. So it's quite important to make that statement and make it clear. It's also an area appropriate to mention just briefly the kind of people that you've worked in, maybe the kind of sectors. So if you've got real strength in a particular sector, let's say financial services for example, and you'd worked for RBS, uh, HBOS, um, and any of the other big banks nationwide, whatever, you could mention those people because they're big, meaningful brand names. People will understand them and they will inf it will infer a certain level of ability and, and competence, generally speaking. There are probably some companies that you might not want to mention, even if you had worked for them. Um, so that requires a little, little bit of thought. Um, and importantly, it's an area where you can then introduce this sort of slightly different format to the CV, which I'll show you an example of right now. So let, let's take an example in, of, of an individual. Um, they tend to be a project manager most of the time. So they're saying, okay, since July 2006 until now, I am, have been an independent contractor. You could say freelance consultant, uh, freelance contractor, professional contractor. Words again, whatever you're comfortable with. In, in this case, slash project manager, because that's what this person's done most of the time and probably what they want to target going forwards. And then just a brief explanation. So it's saying, since 2006, have operated as a professional contractor, completing assignments for high-profile companies such as, and that could be the RBS, HBOS, Nationwide, whatever. Um, then importantly, below is a list of example assignments completed over this period, as well as major projects from a permanent career, if you'd had an earlier permanent career. If you hadn't, you wouldn't need to mention it, of course. And in no particular order, and not all are listed. Because what's going to follow is a selection of projects that you've been involved with, again, more detail coming up, that explains and demonstrates your capability for the kind of jobs you're targeting in the future um, and, and, and to appeal to whoever the target audience is. So this list could change both in order on the CV, you could populate it with different case studies depending on who you are targeting. It gives you an enormous amount of flexibility to deal with those kind of issues we talked about earlier where people find frustrated by either sticking to chronological order because it doesn't suit their circumstances, it doesn't sell their message well, or whether you've done a whole variety of things and you only want to pick the ones that are relevant for a particular audience, um, or where you've been involved in some senior roles earlier on in your career and then had to take a backward step for whatever reason, or there, where there are big gaps in your career and you don't really want that to be obvious, you can't hide it forever and a day, but if if you want to try and avoid making that obvious to start with, this is a brilliant way of packaging the information you have got and putting your best foot forward. Because what it's saying is, I am a contractor, I've done a lot of different things, and in effect, here's a sample of the stuff that I've done, which I think well, you'll find most interesting. That's what it's saying. So it's a really good way of, of uh, structuring the CV. Now, in, as regards to these case studies, um, which I keep re referring to, uh, there's a number of important things. Um, I've hinted at the fact that it gives you modularity to the CV and, and a bit certain a variance to your CV, and that's certainly true. So it does imply, therefore, that you need to pick the ones that are most relevant. So let's, for example, say you've, you've got a really um, strong career. Um, you might have done, I don't know, 25, 30, 50 different projects in your life. You can't mention that all on a CV. That's not going to help your cause. So typically, we'd say pick eight. eight. Eight of the strongest things, most relevant things for your target audience. Not not the eight most impressive things that you think are impressive because you enjoyed them, but the eight most impressive things that your target audience would agree with and would make them think this person is, is a no-brainer. We must see them because, because, because. So eight is the magic number. Not something that has to be stuck to. Six to eight would be fine. But any less than that is not a good enough spread. Any more than that makes the document too long for reasons you'll see later. Um, so typically eight projects that you've been involved with that are relevant to your target audience. And when I say projects, I do mean projects, not periods of employment. So this, again, to, to 
to um, reaffirm the point that what we're doing here is we're providing your target audience uh, to help build a business case as to why they should connect with you, speak with you, interview you, whatever, but take your application further forward. The reason why they should do that is because they're about to see a sample of projects that if replicated in their own business would do them very proudly and make them think, yeah, this person's the right person. So what we're not doing is listing out chronologically what you've been up to. We're picking the most relevant things you've done and displaying them in a compelling way on your CV. Um, and so you might have been employed by a particular company for, let's say, 24 months, and within that conducted eight projects. So we're saying maybe one, two, three of those projects might be relevant and appropriate to put on your CV. And we talk about each of those projects one by one. Um, not trying to compartmentalize all of the 24 months into a short, succinct paragraph, because that just doesn't work and confuses the hell out of people. Again, I'll show you some examples in a minute. I, I mentioned earlier, for those eagle-eyed people, actually, that, that, that we'd write these case studies in a nice, consistent, neat format that would make it easy for people to read. And to do that, we use an acronym which is not ours. It exists in lots of different places but the, the STAR acronym, and that stands for Situation, Task, Action, Results. And it's a really useful way of breaking up fairly complex events or projects or assignments, deconstructing them, and then enabling us or you to rewrite them in a slightly more succinct manner. It's also a really good way of dealing with competency-based questions, um, I would suggest as well, um, for reasons you'll see very shortly. So here's an example. This is actually off... Um, it's a real example, and it's off our, our boss's um, CV, um, and he worked earlier in his career for um, Enterprise Rent-A-Car, so that's the ERAC bit. So the descriptor here is just to provide a little bit of background to suggest that um, uh, there was a business transformation project, and the role that he performed at this moment in time was interim operations manager for a period of time and this period of time is six months. And here's the case study, uh, written using the STAR methodology. So the situation, I'll again, you can read the text yourselves, um, but the situation is the first sentence. So Iraq Enterprise Rent a Car acquired an unprofitable competitor south of England that required transformation. That's the situation. Um, very easy to understand, even somebody not knowledgeable in the marketplace would be able to grab hold of that and broadly understand what was going on. The bit in the middle, uh, sorry, the next sentence, I should say, sorry, the next sentence headed appointed interim operations manager. That's the task. So the weight resting on uh, Matt's shoulders, the guy who wrote the CV, was the fact that he was interim operations manager um, and he was there to rebrand the business and do some other bits and pieces. The bulk of the, the paragraph is the actions so things that Matt actually did, uh, so he performed a review of the business, exited underperforming staff, recruited new team, blah, 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 you can read the rest. And then the final sentence is that uh, the result um, It's quite compelling because in this case he succeeded in rebranding the business, which is one of the issues, and he turned around a financial loss into a profit within a fairly tight time scale. So in a fairly modest amount of text, Matt's been able to explain something that took him six months, probably was fairly frustrating and enjoyable at the same time, um, but is meaningful, um, and he did quite a lot of stuff. Now, most people faced with the challenge of explaining that project would have taken a large chunk of A4 paper to have explained, um, or would have over-abbreviated and failed to get across the key points. So by using this STAR methodology um, and being quite ruthless with it and being very disciplined on how much space you take up, all things that are more complicated to go into at this moment in time or too complicated to go into, but the, the model itself works really well. And if you imagine being asked a question at interview, give us an example of when, in this case, you, know, you transform something or turn something around, if you spoke that and gave it verbally as an answer, it could be delivered in a meaningful amount of time, it would make sense, 
it would give people a nice, hopefully warm feeling that they were onto a good person. So it's a really useful way, as I say, of deconstructing complex events, repackaging them and representing them in a more compelling manner. That's what we spend our lives doing, and if you want to build up a good, effective CV, that's how you need to approach this kind of case study methodology. And we'd replicate that, as I say, probably up to eight times on the CV, but the key thing is making sure you pick relevant examples to feature. Don't go rambling on about stuff that your target audience will not find compelling. Okay, I'm going to take a break now, uh, metaphorically. Actually, it's not a break from me talking, unfortunately. But um, I'm going to take a break, and I'm going to do two things. One of which is that a lot of people tend to ask us by now, or ask us at the end of the section, what on earth do we do? And so I'm going to briefly explain that. Then I'm going to show you an example of a CV for as far as we've got so far, so you can see it in real life and sort of start putting some of these bits to be together. So uh, very briefly in terms of what we do, this all assumes, of course, that you reach a point at which you think you need help, um, because if you don't need help, then this bit won't be that relevant to you. So our job is to create documents, business cases that will significantly increase the interview rate. That's what we're paid to do, and, and that's what we can do, and it does happen. Um, yeah, we don't promise miracles, but at the same time, if you're not getting the traction you want, and you've decided that enough's enough, first relief point for most people is that somebody like us exists in the first place, and that actually if you get your um, evidence together and represent it in the right way, it can make a significant difference to the performance of your document in the marketplace. If you use that kind of service, in effect what happens, we match you up with an individual who can help you. We work on that value proposition. So what have you got to offer the world? What's the value and return on somebody's investment you can give? And how should you convey that to your target audience? We can help identify those skills that you've got and put a sanity check on them if you like. We write up that because we extract from you in the nicest possible way the raw data needed to write up those case studies we've just talked about. Um, as I say, as standard, we provide eight. Um, lots of our clients then buy a whole heap more, either then or in future years and months, build up a portfolio, and then they can pre-select which ones to use on their CV at any given moment in time. So it's a brilliant way of building up a document, particularly from contractors, which will evolve in time. You know, you'll do other projects. You'll be involved in other things. You'll need to pull experiences from... A, a reasonable period of time ago maybe that are more relevant to a particular target audience. You can have that flexibility. Um, we give you that sort of sanity check also on whether your projects are the right ones and whether they truly are providing the compelling evidence required or not, and we'll be honest with you about that. Um, and ultimately, we're there to write up this from scratch. We're not here to amend things. We don't tweak people's CVs. We don't uh, look at it and say, oh, yeah, I'll just to amend it here and there and you'll be fine. That just never ever works, I'm afraid. Those services exist, but they're wholly pointless. So if we're writing a CV, we start from scratch um, and construct a new document. And it's all really geared up to, to maximize your appeal to your marketplace um, and to make sure that the message you're conveying is the right message. So uh, that's a bit about us. Um, and if you are interested in that, right at the end of the session, when we sign off, there are, as you might have seen in the bottom of the previous slide, there's some big discounts that are available to people who've participated in this evening's webinar that are available for a limited time, and it is genuinely limited. Once they're over, they're over. Um, and so if you want to get ready for the new year um, and present a better voice and image to the marketplace, um, and I might touch on LinkedIn later as well. If we have a little bit more time, I'll, I'll just touch on LinkedIn. Then we have a great package where we can sort that all out for you for a substantial saving, well over 100, 100 quid's worth of savings. Now, I promise to show you an example of the CV before we go any further. Let me do that. And um, you can then see uh, how it all comes together. So just bear with me whilst I... Um, Reduce the size of this CV. So this is Matt. Matt's our leader in the business. I'm just going to shrink the CV a little bit. Hopefully you'll all be able to see that as it appears on the screen. Um, I think just one or two people who I can see can't see it yet, but I'll just talk through it for now. So 
the, um, the format, of it, this is a, a typical example of the format of CV, how it looks and feels, in other words, to that which we churn out for our clients day in, day out. Um, very simple at the top, um, just uh, name and contact details. Whether you have an email there or mobile or home or an office doesn't really matter. It's some combination of the, the easiest ways to get hold of you as an individual. Um, why is there no address there? Well, um, it's not important in the great scheme of things. Um, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that you put your address at the top of the CV. It can harm you as much as it can help you. If you're the right kind of person for a role, um, then you're the right kind of person for the role. Where you live um, isn't actually a big deal unless somebody's actually made it, make, making it a big deal. And if it is, they'll look for that information, which encourages them maybe to read the document a bit more. So we deliberately don't put address details at the top of the CV. The executive summary or professional summary, as some people might call it, is there in all its glory. And it describes exactly what Matt is, what his value proposition is, uh, the skills that he has, um, and in effect, what return on somebody's investment he might have to offer. The expertise area, again, that could be expertise, key areas of expertise, key skills, whatever you want to call it, it doesn't really matter. Um, it's the content that's vital. And you'll see here there's a selection of things that Matt has picked, which you know, we have to assume would be relevant to his target audience. They're truthful, um, and they are typically well-searched phrases that you might find people looking for. So it would increase the chances of his CV popping up in somebody's search criteria. Then you'll see that little box marked current role, um, which I suggested was a good positioner for what follows. So it's saying, and this isn't strictly true because Matt isn't a freelance contractor, but if he was, this is how he'd position his CV. Um, and so it's describing what he is. Um, it's describing how long he's been in that position, the entity he operates under. Um, and that he's stating that what follows is a list of things which demonstrate his capabilities and areas of competence. And then the meaty bit of the CV, and this is where the format differs um, from a more traditional CV, is this area which I'll scroll down so you can see uh, the bottom half of page one and the top third of page two are about to hit your screens. And so you can see a selection of things which Matt has chosen to feature. Um, they are, yeah, in some regards, fictitious, of course. But the structure, scale, uh, format of what you see is exactly how we'd construct the information for you if we were writing your CV. So you, you have to assume for the moment that Matt's picked a number of examples that are relevant for what he'd want to do. Um, that are um, typical of his competence areas and areas of strength. Um, and then typically that little heading, um, what, he, what he was doing, in what context. The only thing that he's not put on here, which um, we would put on your CV if you'd had any extensions or renewals to contracts within uh, periods of time, they would be good things to put on the CV, either here or in another section that I'll come on to later, or in both because it's good evidence of your abilities if you keep getting renewals or extensions to contracts. Um, other than that, you can see that each of the project slash assignments, um, they're, they're a particular size, six lines deep. Um, there's a really key reason for that, which I won't go into right now, but you should trust me, there's a reason for that. It makes them all look equally weighted. You'd be surprised how bad it looks if you set out three or four examples that you think are strong and then the last one is half the size of the first two um, or there's some disconnect between the relationship and the size because it just appears that you've you've literally given up on the last one that you underestimate it yourself you undervalue it yourself and it's almost meaningless you'll be surprised visually how bad that actually looks so it is quite important to provide equal weighting to the things that you've done um, you have to be ruthless with the editing because in most cases people could write absolute reams on what they've done and in many cases they do, wholly pointless. Remember as you're building a business case, why somebody should interview you, they just want a snapshot. They want to see that you've got the competence to perform in areas that are important to them. So this is just giving a snapshot 
Lots of questions, I'm sure, could be asked, lots of detail to provide, but that's not the point of the CV. The point of the CV is to get you the interest and get you the interview, at which point people will then want to ask possibly a whole heap more questions, but that's a different issue. The CV's job is to get you there in the first place. So um, that just gives you a flavor for the structure. So, and the important thing here is that um, if, if you think this could work for you, great. You know, it, we know it's effective, we know it works, but we're also realistic enough to know that in some cases, as I said earlier, it doesn't work um, or it doesn't work as effectively as in some cases it would, um, which is why we offer a more traditional format. So as I say, if you're interested by this, um, either to do it yourself or to use our services, yeah, we, we need a more detailed conversation to give you best advice. You don't feel compelled you have to do something like this just because you're a contractor. There are another layer of detail we need to go into. But for some people, this really answers a lot of questions and deals and solves a lot of problems because it provides them with a way out of the, the, the horrible frustration of sticking to chronological order when they know it doesn't work for them. So it is something you have to think about or work with us on, um, but as I say, for some people, it works really well. Let's talk a little bit more now about the um, other bit of the CV, and then um, we'll come back to that and show you the sort of tail end of Mac CV in real life. So, in fairness, you might say, okay, well, you, you've, you've constructed a CV that does genuinely seem to build a strong business case, tick. Um, it gets across the information I'd like to get across as a professional contractor, tick. Um, but people will want to know, of course, uh, what I have been up to in some kind of order. People do like to see that, and of course they do. So we provide that. We just don't provide it in the place that it is often seen, which is, on most people's case, page one of the CV, and then throughout they just stick to that chronological order. So we create another section. After all those case studies that you saw on Matt's CV, and I'll, I'll show you the example later, let's say after that section, then we deal with the career chrono chronology <laughs> um, and simply um, because we don't want the document to go on too long and we, we don't need to provide lots of detail. It is just a one-liner of dates from to, name of the client, job title, as simple as that. So you just list them and it would show where you've been and who you've been uh, working for and in what capacity. And you might want to put in brackets. Um, whether that was contract or permanent, if you've got a mix, um, if it was all contract, you might have made reference to that elsewhere, you don't need to repeat the fact. Um, and it literally is, as I've said, one line only. Um, it's another area where you might put, uh, as I mentioned earlier, whether you've got any extensions or renewals, because that is a material um, point that you'd need to mention. So typically, and I'll show you Matt's example later, it could say you know, January 2010 to February 2012, um, Rolls-Royce PLC, project manager, in brackets, contract, um, and then comma, five extensions or renewals, close bracket. That simple. Um, really effective way of just getting the message across. But as I say, it gives people that um, reference point, if you like, that they will be looking for but it provides no detail. The details all in the case studies we looked at earlier. After that, um, there would be a bit of um, personal information, bits and pieces, which I'm not going to go into right now, but you know, address, phone numbers if you've not already mentioned them, LinkedIn, profile, reference or URL, um, languages, security clearance if you've got it, anything like that could go bundled in a particular area. And of course things like education, qualifications, yes we'd want to talk about those. Um, um, but they're fairly um, yeah, as is, there's not a lot different you can do with them, you've either got things or you haven't. But notice that they're all mentioned towards the back of the CV. Um, if you've got an MBA or a particular professional accreditation that could be mentioned in your opening professional summary. So you could say degree educated project manager or an MBA educated blah de blah um, or a Prince 2 qualified or an ISEB qualified. Um, those kind of impressive qualifications, almost like industry standard qualifications, they can be mentioned at the top of the CV 
but not in any detail, just making reference to the fact that you are a graduate or you have an MBA or you are professionally accredited with certain qualifications. Um, the detail would always be further on in the CV because it's not the stuff that's going to make a difference to you getting an interview or not, generally speaking. Um, the stuff that's going to make a difference is all the stuff about building your business case and what have you got to offer that particular organization. However, one area of the CV that a lot of people don't use, um, what people tend to do um, is put on their CV fairly innocent but pointless things like references available on request. If you've got that on your CV, um, it's just a waste of space. Um, wholly pointless, doesn't mean anything at all. If people want to take references on you, they'll take references on you. Whether you offer them or not doesn't make any difference. Certainly not going to make a difference as whether you get an interview or not. What is wholly more productive is whether you have some testimonial evidence or recommendations that you can provide your target audience with. Um, the background to this is that um, earlier in the early days, if you go back, I don't know, 10, 15 years, people might have written a nice little email or a note saying, yeah, thanks very much for your help on this project. You did really well. Um, you know, it would be a pleasure to work with you again. That's testimonial evidence. That's quite a good recommendation if you could put a name against it. But, of course, increasingly, um, we're getting good evidence come through LinkedIn, and in some cases, not so good evidence. If you've got a LinkedIn profile and if you've got some recommendations on LinkedIn which are meaningful and relevant, um, then they can be ported across onto your CV, maybe two or three. It depends on the individual, but you don't want a whole list of them and you need to make sure they're from people that are credible. So if it's your mate down the pub who's on LinkedIn as well and just said that they like you and that you're a good egg, again, wholly pointless. But if it's a boss, former boss, employer, manager, somebody who's been responsible for bringing your services into a business and who can then attest to your abilities, then yes, that could be very relevant and appropriate and should be mentioned on your CV. And it does add a lot of value, particularly for contractors where yeah, everybody's looking for, if you like, a bit of a safety net. You know, Is this person as good as they say they are? Is this person going to be able to deliver? And of course, they'll flush some of that out of the interview. But if you've already provided them with some good testimonial evidence, makes people feel more comfortable. Um, and on a CV, it tends to look slightly more authoritative than it does on LinkedIn, where I'm afraid already there's this sort of creeping, it has this person just recommended Joe Blog because Joe Blog's recommended them, which of course is visible, um, and certainly a whole lot better than those endorsements that you get on LinkedIn, which tend, again, to be a bit of sort of a backslapping exercise in many cases and, and lose credibility. Um, so done properly makes a big difference, can add value not done properly, um, doesn't add any value, and to be honest, better not to do anything at all than just to go to market with some you know, fairly pointless comments. But an important section if you've got the material to back it up. Very briefly, um, I will talk about LinkedIn because uh, there's, some, there's some things that you should make sure you take care of. First, first thing to be wary of is that note at the bottom, you didn't already know it, the vast majority of people that are hiring folk, um, and that's permanent as well as contractors, will check you out on LinkedIn um, before making a decision, often actually before making a decision on whether to interview you, let alone hire you. Um, if you've got a bad CV that's not getting you results in the marketplace and all you've done is dump that into LinkedIn, you know, guess what? You're replicating the problem um, and you can do something about that as well. Um, part of the deal that we have to offer this evening includes completely rewriting your LinkedIn profile, which we do for a lot of our clients, precisely for the reason that it's getting used more and more often to recruit people and hire people. And if you didn't know that, I think statistically uh, it was announced quite recently that more people were hired via LinkedIn um, in the last year than they were through Monster.com, um, and it's only going more and more in favour of LinkedIn. And recruiters and hirers pay a lot of money to LinkedIn to gain access to their particular and specific recruitment tools. So it's not just a recruiter who might have a LinkedIn profile who's doing the searching, although they do exist. Um, it's also the employer and the recruiter who have paid a lot of money to LinkedIn to get functionality that you wouldn't ordinarily have to find people like you. Um, but if you get your LinkedIn profile wrong, you run the risk of alienating yourself and not getting noticed. And you'll never know unless you've got the facility to track who's been looking at your profile. And even then, you won't know why they've been looking at it necessarily. So get the LinkedIn profile sorted. 
Um, typically, very briefly, some of the things that people get wrong, um, the little bit of text you have underneath your name called the professional headline in LinkedIn, um, most people tend to either just put what they're currently doing in there, that's not wholly useful, people can see what you're doing later on in the profile, um, so make that more relevant. That ought to be the combination of what you are and what your value proposition is, so literally that, that content off the CVs that we write can be lifted, slightly edited, because LinkedIn only allows a certain number of characters in that professional headline, but it needs to be far more compelling than you know, currently project manager at such and such. That's not a sales message. That's a fact, and, and not a very impressive fact. And worse still is available now, looking for next contract, because LinkedIn is a tool that most people arrive on as a searcher thinking, can I find a gem here, hopefully not a hidden gem, but a gem, and their fingers are literally crossed hoping that if they do find somebody, that that person will be available. What they don't really want to see, or actually turns people off, is that person appearing to be desperate to find something. Um, that's not a good marketing position. So create a bit of allure, if you like, <laughs> if you want to view it like that. Um, position yourself as being you know, expertise within your area um, and make people want to contact you, to connect with you, to email you, to interview you or whatever. Don't, don't come across as if you desperately want somebody to approach you because that will actually turn people off rather than encourage them. Um, the summary area of LinkedIn, which is the main bit underneath the, the name and the location that you're in, your professional headline. Again, most people go rambling on in there and, and replicate a lot of what's in their CV. Um, actually needs to be written slightly differently. I can't go into the detail right now, but the tense needs to be different. The, the approach needs to be subtly different, but above all and beyond, you need to make your business case in the summary uh, as to why somebody should hire you, a bit like your professional summary off your CV. Um, so that needs to be um, well tailored. And don't go into lots of detail about the, um, the, the positions that you've had or the projects you've been working on. You need to provide a framework, enough for people to be interested in you, but not so much detail that they could read it all and come up with the decision themselves without engaging with you further. That is the ideal situation, of course. Um, you know, there are always going to be people who want more information, um, and there'll be others who couldn't care less. You, you've just got to go with a bit of an average um, common denominator, which is give people enough information for them to think this could be the right person, but not so much that they can make a decision about you without further engagement. Um, and don't forget that you can restructure, if you, if you, if you knew it, don't forget, if you don't know it, uh, take into account the fact you can restructure LinkedIn quite a lot yourselves um, and um, the positions are all drag and drop and so we can we can relay and restructure the whole profile to better suit how people tend to read and look for information um, and you can do that yourselves if you know what to do uh, but there's a whole lot of customization you can go into and there are some parts of LinkedIn that most people don't use like the project section which, which for contractors is an absolute must if you're not using projects as a contractor, um, then you really need to sort that out. It makes a, makes a big difference and provides your reader with a lot more compelling evidence about what you're capable of. Um, let me give you um, Matt TV again. If we get back to that, uh, to show you the, the back end of his TV and how it fits. So what you'll see on the screen shortly as it filters through to you all is the bottom of page two and then a tiny bit of the top of page three. Uh, most people's CVs that we write are three pages long, just so you know. As I said earlier, right at the beginning, there is a bit of an urban myth about how long a CV should be. For those who are really, really hell-bent on having two pages, it can be done for most contractors. But um, it really and sincerely, we've never had anybody come back to us and said, you bunch of so-and-sos. Um, why have you developed a three-page CV for me where the market clearly defines it needing to be two pages? It's never happened. Um, and so um, three pages is fine. And what you see at the bottom of page two is, is what we briefly talked about most recently. The career chronology for Matt, so he's describing exactly what he'd done since the dawn of time through to now. 
Um, he's mentioned whether you were his contract permanent or interim. And as I said earlier, you might want to add to that the number of extensions or renewals if they were um, prevalent. That's a valuable piece of information. He's got his education. If he had any other professional accreditations, he's got a membership there, which is useful. If he'd got anything else like Prince 2, you'd want to mention it there. Um, MBA, any languages or skills of that nature, they could be mentioned there as well. A bit about personal details. And um, and then finally, oh, sorry, uh, for those who are... So page three, um, so it varies by person. Sometimes this is the bottom of page two. Sometimes it's somewhere down page three. But we'll use this as the balancer often. Um, this is the recommendation section. And as I say, if you've got the right evidence to pull, um, it's a brilliant area to um, load with either recommendations off LinkedIn or other testimonial evidence you've collected that demonstrates your abilities to do the stuff you just claim to have on your CV. It's really useful. So that's CV um, in terms of its structure. Um, I'll just um, go back to the final slide on our uh, webinar this evening. And in, in terms of, I promised a deal and, um, and how you could take advantage of it and that it was time limited. Just so you know, and again, this is, you know, if, if you've decided that your CV is fine or if you've got the information, obviously you don't need to be thinking about this. If you've not yet got the proof, but you suspect your CV is not up to the job, um, and if you want us to evaluate it, we'll take a look at it in fairness and give you an honest assessment. Um, but if you've decided that you need professional help, then this kind of offer is really worth considering um, for a number of reasons. The standard prices for writing a CV for us, and the market for doing the same kind of thing, the market is very similar. So it's, it's give or take, it's pretty much the same for anybody doing this kind of work at, at the level of detail that we do it. Typically, a CV on its own is 299 plus fat. A LinkedIn profile with the CV is 50 quid plus fat. A cover letter, 30 quid plus fat. So you're looking at a substantial price normally to get those three things done, um, well north of 400 quid. Um, and we're tonight, uh, until Monday, close of play Monday, um, offering all of those things, so a professionally written CV, LinkedIn profile, cover letter, the 275 plus VAT. Uh, so it's saving just under 125 quid. So it's a, it's a good deal. If you're interested, you can order it and take advantage of the service before Christmas. You can order it and take advantage of the service after Christmas, and we'll, we'll freeze the price for you. So you, can, um, you don't have to do it before Christmas if you know your timescales won't fit, but we'll take the order and hold it for you as long as you like within reason, even if it's through till some middle of next year. And the world record so far is just over 12 months for somebody having done that. Why, I don't know, but there you go. That's their choice. So you can sort of buy and then park it for as long as you want, as long as you place your order by Monday the 9th. Um, and to be honest, you can even buy it if you've got any relatives or sons or daughters who've just graduated and need the service. You can buy it as a Christmas present and we'll gift wrap a voucher for them and you can take advantage of that way. Um, so there are all sorts of ways you can play the tunes. Um, but the first thing is you need to get to a point where you've decided that it's relevant considering the option. But if you're there already, it's a brilliant deal and you won't get any better than that. Um, the webinar deals are always the best deals. Um, if you've got any questions about the format of CV that would work best for you, so if you think, yes, I would like that service, um, but I can't make up my mind between the chronological order of CV, which we didn't really talk a great deal about, but, but it exists as a more traditional format, or this slightly different approach using case studies, that, that's fine. We, we, we can talk you through that and guide you and give you best advice and you can make a decision. Some people go for both. Some people choose both. And we can do that for a modest extra charge. It's not two times 275. It's a lot less than that. So, um, but that needs further discussion if you are interested in that. For those of you who want to do it yourself, um, and that's absolutely fine, um, if you think you would like some a bit more advice and guidance, but have a fancy you go yourself, we've got a really good deal on the uh, website link I'm about to send to you, um, which is, um, we call it a post-webinar pack. So it's some templates, a workbook, and an, a really good book on how to handle interviews, um, and some tips and advice for a fairly me, um, paltry 15 quid plus fact, so 18 quid, 
and you get yourself a really useful webinar pack which um, you can go away and look at. If you subsequently decide to order our services, then you can come back and do that, of course. But if you fancy a go to start with yourselves, a bit more information and guidance, you can take away a pack which we'll send to you for, uh, say, for 18 quid. Um, and, um, and that's available, um, again, until Monday the 9th, because normally that's a lot more money as well. If you want to take advantage of either of those offers, then just go to that website. And if you just bear with me, I shall um, enter that into the um, uh, questions chat room area. And you should see it appear on the screen. Just copy and paste that because you can't click directly on the screen, I'm afraid. Or make a note of that website. That will take you to a landing page and, and then a bit more information on there about the two services. And ultimately, if you are interested, you can click through, pay, um, and everything will take care of itself. And then we'll be in touch. And, and just quickly, um, what you're paying for is somebody to spend a couple of hours with you on the phone or Skype or however works best, extract from you all the raw data we need to be able to write a CV, interrogate um, what you're good at, what you're able to offer the world, provide a bit of a sanity check on that, and then rewrite your CV from scratch, obviously having collected all the evidence about those case studies as well if you want to go down that route, rewrite your CV, um, you work with us until you're happy with it. So there's no time limit on the service. There's no limit on the number of times you work with us to make sure you're happy with it. We'll sort your LinkedIn profile after we've sorted your CV, and we'll provide you with a cover letter, which you can use for a variety of different uses. Um, and that's for the money that you pay. So it's quite an intensive service and, and you know, demands a fair amount of effort on both parts. But it's the best way of sorting out your proposition and getting better message to the marketplace. Okay, um, let me just um, go to questions now. Um, and for those that want to hang around and listen to the answers, you're more than welcome to. Um, we've got about another 15 minutes to go before I shut this thing down. So. Um